again, uh, and welcome to this uh, virtual study abroad session. My name is Greg Spear. Uh, I am an assistant director in the Office of Global Education. And this session is going to focus specifically on opportunities to study abroad in the summer. Um, the goals of the session are just to sort of give a broad overview of what types of opportunities there are to study in the summer, where you can go, what you can study, um, and how students can begin preparing to eventually participate in, st in summer study abroad. Um, so hopefully, if you've attended any of the other sessions this week, um, you'll start to get a sense for some of the, the differences and some of the sort of unique factors um, about summer study abroad versus more traditional um, longer term study abroad programs. The session itself is going to consist of a, a presentation uh, by me, which will start shortly, um, should really be pretty brief, 12 or 15 minutes. Um, and then we will shift to a sort of live Q&A at the end of the presentation uh, with some help from my colleague, Sam, who's moderating. Uh, we will take those questions um, and try to get through all of them in the order that they come in. All right. So let's begin. So we like to start these sessions with um, usually a discussion, in this case more of a monologue, about why study abroad um, is something that all Georgetown students should consider. Um, so if you've attended any of the other sessions this week, you might have heard some of my colleagues talk about this, um, specifically what types of benefits come from study abroad. Um, the answer is that there really is no uh, single answer. Um, it varies a lot based on the goals uh, that different students have, um, your specific idea of what global learning means. Um, the benefits are numerous. You might uh, be somebody who links studying abroad directly to what you are studying academically at Georgetown, right? So a good example of that is students who are studying a foreign language, right? Obvious connection there. Um, there are students who are studying global issues and want to go abroad in order to learn about them and more close up or maybe from a different um, national or cultural perspective. Um, there are also uh, co-curricular reasons why students choose to study abroad. Um, maybe they want to experience a new culture, gain some skills or knowledge um, that they feel might make them a stronger uh, job candidate after graduation. Um, there are students who are going purely for personal development reasons. Um, one of the outcomes that we see most consistently from students who study abroad is an increased sense of uh, independence, resilience, self-awareness, um, some of those sort of less uh, tangible qualities um, that are an important part of development. And so from a student learning and development standpoint, um, study abroad is a very well-established, high-impact practice. Um, and at Georgetown, we believe it's something that all students can benefit from for a whole variety or a whole combination of reasons. So um, we'll talk a little bit now about what summer study abroad opportunities look like at Georgetown. Um, and again, I'm gonna be sort of focusing on what sets them apart from more traditional longer term versions of study abroad. Um, so uh, obviously the, the most important defining feature has to do uh, with the fact that these programs do not take place during the traditional academic year, obviously from the name, they, they take place uh, during the summer intercession. Um, some additional uh, and, and very, I think, defining features um, uh, also have to do with the length of these programs. Um, they are typically much shorter than spending a full semester in a foreign country or studying, studying at a foreign university. Um, the programs range typically from about two weeks at their shortest um, and some of the longer ones uh, range up to six to eight weeks. Um, in total, we have uh, usually 20 to 24 uh, individual programs offered every summer. They change a little bit from year to year, but the number of them stays roughly consistent. Uh, we are not necessarily going to delve into the details of each of these different programs. Um, the goal here is to kind of speak in broad strokes about um, summer study abroad programs, um, just so you can kind of get a sense for how they're different um, and why students might want to consider them. The other key feature about summer study abroad, 
programs that I really want to highlight is that most of them are what we call faculty led programs. Um, and so that's exactly what it sounds like, um, but it's an important feature. It means that a Georgetown professor from the main campus is going abroad with a group of students um, and is teaching and directing that program on site. So we're not uh, sending students to a foreign university or um, a study abroad provider. Um, all of these programs are developed and created and led by Georgetown for Georgetown students. Um, so that's an important factor. Academically, um, this also means that all of the coursework that students obtain on these programs, those are automatically considered Georgetown courses. There's no transfer process. They appear in the schedule of classes. Again, they're being taught by Georgetown professors. Um, and so you don't have to deal with that same transfer process that you uh, might have to consider when taking courses at a foreign university. Um, another important thing about these programs that we like to highlight um, is that each of them has a very specific academic topic or theme, right? And that theme is usually related to the location in which the student is studying, right? And so you'll see these if you go on our website um, and you are searching under our program search by term and you look at summer programs, you'll notice that they all have uh, some kind of an academic theme in their title. So you might see our, our program in Cape Town says social transformation in South Africa. That's a JUPS course um, looking at social justice issues in post-apartheid South Africa. Um, likewise, new programs in Australia that say politics of marine conservation on the Great Barrier Reef, right? So you know what you're studying when you go on that program as opposed to a university uh, abroad where you might just get to choose from whatever their course offerings and their departments have to offer. So it's important when we talk about summer study abroad programs uh, to be thinking not just about where you want to study, but also what you want to study, right? It's not enough to simply decide you want to spend a couple of weeks in Rome this summer. Um, if you choose that program, you really have to be ready to be deeply immersed eight to 10 hours a day in, in the study of, in that case, classical art and architecture and, and history in Rome. Okay, so that's just an important distinction to make. Um, as far as different fields of studies, um, one thing I wanted to sort of point out is that there's a very wide variety of academic areas and academic foci that are that are represented in these programs. Um, there are programs that are designed specifically for majors um, from all four undergraduate schools at Georgetown, um, and many many uh, majors, many many fields of study. Um, so it's not just uh, language and culture immersion, uh, even though there are some that are certainly geared toward that. Um, we have intensive foreign language programs that run in the summer. Um, we have those currently uh, for Spanish, French, German, Italian, Arabic, Russian, um, and Chinese uh, and Mandarin. So um, there is that option for people who are looking for like a deep dive into, into language and cultural immersion. Um, but many of these programs do not require language study or any kind of language exposure before you go. They're taught in English and they're looking at a specific academic topic in that location that has less to do with the language and the culture of that, of that location. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that uh, most of these programs really emphasize field-based learning, right? There's no point in taking a group of students all the way to uh, to, to Paris or to South Africa um, just to teach them in a classroom, right? So they usually try to take full advantage of resources and opportunities available to study on site. Um, so a lot of times that involves different kinds of field trips, different kinds of excursions. In some cases, um, there is more of an experiential design where students are doing um, either research, such as in a lab like this one, this, these photos are, uh, from our summer program in Buenos Aires, uh, which is basically a, an internship in a, in a lab studying um, virology, and then looking at how that virology research translates into clinical care in a hospital setting. So there's a little bit of both sides um, of, that, of that spectrum. Um, 
We also have uh, field-based research programs. Um, so I mentioned a program in Australia that takes students out to the Great Barrier Reef where they're actually in the water, helping to collect samples from coral reefs there. Um, we have a program in Zambia um, that is an interdisciplinary uh, research site uh, in which students are taking part either in collecting oral histories, um, maybe doing soil sample sampling to look at uh, you know how crops have changed in that region over time. So there's a, a lot of opportunity to actually get out into the location that you're studying as opposed to just being in a foreign like a, a, a foreign classroom. Um, I do want to take a, a moment to mention um, a special group of summer study abroad programs um, that take place every summer at Villa de Balze, which uh, hopefully many of you have heard of. Um, for those who haven't, Villa de Balze is Georgetown's academic study center. It's located just outside of, of Florence, Italy. Um, and so every summer, um, the villa will host, uh, you know, a number of these short faculty-led programs. Um, the topics vary. Um, we have a long-standing program from the government department that basically looks at contemporary political theory through the lens of the writings of, of Machiavelli. Um, we have some newer programs, actually one that we started a few summers ago that looks at the history of disease and globalization in Italy. So looking primarily at the Black death and pandemic since then, but obviously now taking on a, a totally different relevance. Um, we have a microbiology course there. We also have courses in journalism and education. Again, they all have something to do with the local uh, context there in Italy. Um, and those are all taught uh, by Georgetown professors, but at Villa de Balze. And so studying at Villa de Balze also kind of gives this extra layer of um, taking part in a Georgetown tradition in a very unique Georgetown experience. Um, the villa itself is designed as a living and learning community. So it is both residential and academic. Um, and so that's a very specific kind of cohort experience um, in addition to whatever the coursework is that you're taking. Um, so I wanna spend a little time talking uh, about planning. Uh, for study abroad. Um, we'll be focusing specifically on the context of summer study abroad programs, but some of this, you know, if you attended other sessions, you may have already heard because it also resembles studying abroad during the semester. So we wanna start with um, language acquisition, language study. Like I said, um, not all summer study abroad programs uh, have any formal language study uh, or require any past uh, coursework in a foreign language to participate in them. So I, I wanna make that abundantly clear. Um, there is a whole set of them that are focused on that. So if that's your jam, then those programs are designed to kind of accelerate language learning and can accept students. Usually from the beginner up to the advanced level, they offer kind of a, a whole spectrum of, of language courses. Um, that doesn't go for all programs. There are some that, um, maybe require that you've already taken two or four semesters of it or placed into a certain level um, in order to apply. Um, if you have questions about that, again, I'll, you know, that's something that we can talk about kind of individually, either at the fair or if you wanted to schedule an advising appointment. Um, so language acquisition itself is not a prerequisite to study abroad in the summer but it is something to um to consider if that's if you want to use the summer to kind of ramp up your um maybe even if you want to sort of get a bunch of the prerequisites out of the way to do a longer term study abroad program this might be a good way to do it on a summer program um in terms of academic planning um unlike semester study abroad programs um where you are essentially proposing to go uh, take an entire chunk of your, your degree somewhere else. And that requires a lot of careful planning and discussion with your deans about exactly what courses you're gonna take and how that's gonna fit when you come back. Um, summer it tends to be a little bit more flexible, right? Um, it's an opportunity for students to either um, 
catch up on, on requirements. It's an opportunity to get ahead. Um, or it might be an opportunity to try something completely outside of your typical course of study. Um, so uh, it is certainly possible, and in many cases, students are using summer study abroad programs to advance certain degree requirements, like within their major or general elective requirements or university requirement. Many of them fulfill that. Um, but it's not, it's certainly not required. Um, so OGE can definitely help you understand what coursework is available uh, on these programs, kind of what, what the academic goals or purpose of each program is. Um, but deciding whether it's, it fits your specific needs, um, your academic goals, um, whether it's gonna fulfill specific requirements or not, is something that you um, can discuss with your curricular advising dean. It's also something you could approach um, the, uh, the director of undergraduate studies in your specific major department about. Um, if you have questions, we're obviously here to help. Um, but in general, summer programs um, are less likely to pose really hard curricular restrictions or, or barriers to your ability to, to study abroad. That's important specifically for majors that might have um, very specific requirements or very rigid sequence um, of courses that students have to take. So let's keep moving and talk a little bit about the financial side of studying abroad in the summer. This is where summer study abroad programs uh, do differ um, a little more drastically from, from semester study abroad programs. So for one thing, unlike a semester program where you're essentially paying the same tuition costs as you would for your semester at Georgetown, um, summer study abroad programs all have their own unique program fee. Um, and that is partly a result of the number of credits uh, that students are earning on that program, but it also takes into a lot of other uh, a lot of other factors into account, um, such as the costs of housing and other sort of the on the ground expenses, the length of the program, and things like that. Um, so therefore, there tends to be a little bit of a correlation between the length of the program, its number of credits, and its cost. Um, the program prices uh, will range pretty drastically, um, usually from around $4,200, $4,300 up to ten dollars or $11,000. And again, those are for the much longer programs where students are earning nine, 10, even up to 12 credits. Um, so that's just an important thing to, to sort of keep in mind. Um, if you compare the cost of nine or 10 or 12 credits to a regular semester tuition cost. Um, you'll see that these programs are actually comparably um, a lot less than you would be paying per credit um, during the semester. And that program price includes almost all of your living expenses, your housing, all of the different activities that you'll be doing as part of the program, insurance and things like that. So it leaves very little other than the, the cost of airfare um, to the student's expense. Um, I also want to mention uh, financial aid. Um, students can apply for financial aid during the summer term. Um, it's important to note that it is not part of a student's um, financial aid package for the academic year. It's considered separate. Um, and that Georgetown's commitment to meeting full need at present, that is really only applies to the academic year, right? So um, as far as applying for financial aid, it is available. It tends to be somewhat more limited um, than it is for study abroad during the semester. Um, so that's something that we encourage students to be thinking about and to be asking about um, way in advance as you're getting ready to apply um, to a study abroad program, not after you've been accepted and you're trying to figure out if and how you'll, you'll be able to pay for the cost of it. Um, there are some scholarships available to support uh, students financially to study abroad during the summer. Um, there's a scholarship that that this office, the Office of Global Education Awards annually. Um, it's primarily need-based um, and it's designed to go toward the, the students that have the lowest family contribution. Um, and so we sort of award that uh, without any application process. It's sort of just designed again to um, 
defray some of the costs uh, of students who have the highest demonstrated need. Um, there are a couple of uh, outside scholarships that we direct students to um, in which Georgetown students have, tend to do pretty well. Um, these are more competitive scholarships. Um, the Gilman Scholarship, for instance, through the uh, Department of Education. Um, that is for Pell Grant recipients to have the opportunity uh, to study abroad. Um, there are scholarships through the Foundation for Education Abroad and a couple other organizations. And we have a full directory of those scholarships um, on our website. We also do a lot of advising specifically with students one-on-one -on -one about what scholarship deadlines they're eligible for, when the deadlines are, and how, how to apply. Um, so we're here to help with, with any questions or concerns that students have about, about finances for study abroad. Um, and the last major area of planning um, has to do with safety and security. So, so protecting the health and, and well-being of students while they're abroad uh, is OGE's top, top priority and our top obligation. Um, so we do a lot of monitoring of world events, um, of global health security conditions. Um, we work with partners here at Georgetown, such as in the Office of Risk Management and General Counsel, as well as all of our partners overseas um, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep Georgetown students safe and that we're ready to respond for any types of incidents or emergencies that happen. Um, for summer programs, I mentioned that there is a Georgetown faculty member who is not just teaching, but is also directing and, and therefore is a point of contact on the ground um, to assist in any kind of issues that students are having um, from very, from sort of more minor things like adjusting to a new culture, homesickness, those types of things um, to more serious incidents that may occur. And, and we give them a pretty rigorous training every year before they, they go abroad so that they're well equipped to handle all of those situations. Um, we also count on program participants to help create a culture of safety while abroad. Um, so this includes holding students um, accountable to the main campus code of student conduct. Um, there are some additional expectations and rules sometimes put in place. Sometimes those are based on customs or laws in the country where you'll be studying. So it's really, uh, it, it's a collaborative effort um, to make sure that everybody's doing their part to keep students safe abroad. Um, so for more information, there, there, are, there are a number of ways that you can uh, be in contact with the Office of Global Education. Um, our website is a, a great first step in terms of seeing what programs are available. You can search through the programs in any number of ways. Um, if you know, for instance, you came to this session because you know summer is when you plan to study abroad, you can filter the program search directly by term and just pull up the list of 20 something summer programs. Um, the website also has information about um, some of the financial information um, that I talked about briefly um, in terms of scholarship opportunities, um, health and safety information. Uh, you can also read stories from past study abroad participants. Um, there's uh, information about how to sign up for study abroad 101 sessions, and those are uh, basically peer-led general information sessions about study abroad. Um, you can attend our study abroad fair tomorrow, um, which I already mentioned. Um, I'll be available for part of that, um, as well as all the rest of our advisors. So that's a good chance to just get in and ask some very specific questions about the programs in, in that specific region um, that you're interested in. Um, if you have general questions about study abroad, this email address, OGE Summer Advising at Georgetown.edu, is also a good place to start. Um, so I would encourage you to send any general questions you have about this session, even about specific programs, um, and we'll make sure somebody gets back to you quickly. Um, because I have gone a little over at the time, I'm going to stop there and kick it to our moderator, um, Sam, who has been monitoring the questions that are coming in. Um, Sam, why don't you take it from here and I'll, I'll see what I can do with the questions. Yeah, thanks Greg for all that great information in your presentation. There are a couple of questions that have trickled in throughout the presentation. Um, the first one is, are all of the programs currently on the website going to be offered next year? Mm. Um, so I mentioned that our programs, they, they do change a little bit from year to year, but, but many of them stay pretty fixed. 
Um, so most of the programs that are on there, there's a high chance that they will be offered again next year. Um, we're in the process right now of sort of checking in with each faculty member and each department that runs those programs to make sure that they do intend to do that. And we usually update the program listings um, at, the, at the end of September, the beginning of October. So if you, if you really wanna get a jump start on researching your options, you can certainly start by looking at what's there. Um, they will probably be updated, I would say, within the next um, three to four weeks. And the way you can tell is that the program dates will uh, appear as showing 2021. Um, so that's a good question. Most of those will will most likely be available. If you if you really want to check, feel free to reach out to OGE and we'll, we'll let you know. And then the next question would be, do program costs cover housing? Yeah, they do. Um, all of these programs, the price will include the, the housing and the accommodations. It will include transportation in and around the, the, the city or the town that you're in, right? Assuming that you're gonna be on the move most days for, for program related activities. Um, it covers most of your basic living. In, in most cases, um, at least some meals are included. Um, in many cases, it's most meals. Um, so there's there's individual details about what's included um, on each program's brochure page. There's a whole section that's called the program budget sheet, and it says exactly what is included. And if it's not included, here's kind of a rough estimate of, of what you should expect. But housing is always included. Great. And then the next the next couple of questions have to do with the application process. So when is the earliest that a student can apply for a summer program, and when are the summer applications due? Yeah, I, um, I, I sort of failed to, to address this directly, um, so I'm glad that, that it was raised. Um, summer study abroad programs are available pretty much to any student, so between any, any two years uh, of their time at Georgetown. Um, so that means if you were to study abroad as a rising sophomore, you would be applying at some point during your, your first year. Um, so um, there, there's a tendency for, for study abroad to be talked about at Georgetown as something that you plan to do as a junior and you spend your first two years taking care of all the requirements and like making sure that you've got everything lined up to go abroad as a junior. Um, the reality is that you, you could apply, you know, within a month or two of arriving as a, as a first semester, first year student, um, if you wanted to apply for a summer program. Um, so there's no no real restrictions on on how early a student can apply to do a summer study abroad program, assuming you meet any specific program requirements. Um, as far as when to apply, the application period um, takes place from roughly November until mid-February of, of the academic year before. So um, for summer 2021 next year, we're going to be opening applications about a month and a half from now. Um, they are not due until I think February 16th is, is going to be uh, the deadline this year. Um, the application is not rolling, so there's really no uh, no difference whether you like rush the application in in November or if you wait until a little bit you know later in the application cycle. Um, so yeah. That's, uh, that's when you would roughly be completing the application process. The application itself does not, certainly does not take a full four or five months to complete. It's something you can probably do in an evening or two. It consists of a personal statement, um, uh, one or two recommendations, depending on the program, uh, and then a copy of your unofficial transcripts. Um, and that those are pretty much, and then some sort of specific personal information like emergency contacts and things like that. But it's, it's not an application that should take you weeks to, to complete. And then another question about the application process is, is the application process competitive? That's a really good question. And we get that a lot. Um, in general, no, in this, like, so we, we want every student to have the opportunity to study abroad. And if a summer program is what fits their, their specific criteria best, we want them to be able to do that. Um, so this is not aggressively competitive like, like other kinds of academic opportunities in Georgetown. Um, with that said, there are some programs 
that uh, either have been around a long time uh, or, or for other reasons, just very popular um, in which we, we sometimes do hit the sort of upper limit for, for uh, enrollments um, and there might end up being a short wait list. Um, so for instance, the language program in Barcelona, um, that government course at the Villa, the Machiavelli seminar course, um, the Rome program I mentioned, those tend to hit capacity, um, but they can usually take 20 to 25 students and there might be like 30 who apply. So we're not turning away lots of students. And in most cases, we will try to redirect those students to opportunities that are available. Um, we generally try to make sure that opportunities and, and spots on programs roughly meet the demand from students. It's a good question. Though. Another question that we have is if we attend a summer session abroad, will we still be able to attend an internship or another session on the main campus slash DC? Yeah, we're seeing more and more students do that sort of um, combine opportunities in the summer. Um, a lot of that will have to do with the timing, I suppose, uh, of the summer study abroad programs. Obviously the length of it, because we do have some programs that take a full up to, you know, two months of your summer. Um, so that those programs might make it tricky. Um, but we do have very short programs and, and some of them start in May and are done by June 1st, June 3rd, you know, first, second week of June. So that could leave a lot of time in the summer for a student to either you know, come back and take another class uh, through summer session uh, or to pursue some kind of internship um, or, or just a summer job. Um, so we're, be, we're noticing more and more of that trend. And so we, when we start a new program, we, we try to be strategic about placing it earlier or later in the summer so that, you know, students can, can utilize the rest of their summer. I hope that answers the question. All right, so the final question that I see in the Q&A is, do most students take coursework abroad to, to fulfill major requirements? Um, many do. Um, and again, so I, I mentioned that there are a lot of programs specifically designed for students within a certain department. Um, the MSB, for instance, uh, the, the McDonough School of Business, they have three summer programs that they have designed that they have um, their faculty teach it and it's meant to fit directly into the course sequence of some of their different majors. Um, same goes for the, the Buenos Aires uh, research program that I mentioned. That, that's taught by an NHS professor and most of the students are NHS students and they're earning, they're fulfilling requirements toward their, toward their degrees. Um, again, that doesn't have to be the case. I mean, you might, if you were really interested in, you know, seeing how the healthcare system in Argentina worked and you submitted a very strong application for that program, but you were a student in the college or SFS, you know, theoretically you could still be accepted to it. So um, it really depends on what you're trying to get out of your summer, or what you're trying to get out of study abroad. Um, if you want to sort of like use it to enhance what you're learning about in your major, um, then you can go that route. If, if you're not, then you just have to make sure that you, you understand what the academic focus and, and obligations of the program you choose are gonna be, and that you're okay with them. Wonderful, that looks to be all of the questions that we have. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you again, everybody. Um, this presentation will be made available at some point, so you can always go back and, and reference it. Um, but I would encourage you if, you, if you have questions or if maybe now you have renewed interest in, in study abroad, based on anything you heard, um, just reach out. Um, there are many ways to do it. You can start by searching the programs on our website. Um, you can make an advising appointment. You can come visit us at the fair tomorrow. Um, just because we are not physically on campus doesn't mean that uh, you can't be in contact with you. We're still here to, uh, to serve you. So we'll, we'll end the webinar here. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Sam, for moderating. And we hope to see you guys soon.